Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is a morning update. So we have an article today from the Miami uh, Herald, and it is by an author named Madeline Marr. And it has to do with Jeffrey Epstein's New York mansion and how it used to be a school. Well, I haven't read the article yet. We're going to read it together, so I don't have any details to share with you until we do that. But if it's anything like the rest of the stuff that comes out of the Herald, we know that we have a good article on our hands here. As we're all aware, the Miami Herald was at the, the forefront of breaking the Jeffrey Epstein story from the beginning, you know, digging into this story to make, sh- to, to make sure that it was put into the public view. So I think that the Miami Herald deserves a lot of credit, and especially Julie Brown. Julie K. Brown deserves so much credit, folks. Make sure that you give her the love she deserves. Make sure you check out her work when it, uh, when it pops up, and, you know, follow her on Twitter, or whatever it may be. But she's very courageous. She's a very courageous woman, and she's did great work here as a journalist, and I highly, highly respect the work that she has done. Because we all know how critical I am about journalists, but at the same time, I'm always willing to give credit where credit is due because it's hard work. I understand how hard it is to be a journalist, how hard it is to, you know, facilitate these stories and make sure that you're really focused on what's going on. I understand that it's a, it's a difficult job, especially when you have outside forces attempting to make you quit like Julie K. Brown dealing with Jeffrey Epstein's people and private investigators and, you know, the whole flip. So I think it's important that we uh, we recognize Julie Brown as probably the most influential independent journalist of the year, in my opinion. In, my, in, the, in this host's humble opinion, she is definitely the most influential journalist of the year because of her work with this story. All right, so we're going to jump right in. If you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. My replies might be a little bit slow today because I am, I'm going to the mountains in a little while to do some climbing, see how that works out with a broken finger. <laughs> but I haven't been climbing in about a week, and I'm jonesing big time. So if you email me and I don't email you back right away today, that's that's the reason I'll be out of service. So, all right, let's jump right into this article. And it was originally published by the Miami Herald, but that's behind a paywall. So the Herald Sun also published it and that is not behind a paywall. So that is how I'll share it with you. That way you can check out the article yourselves. Headline, sad and disgusted. Before it was Jeffrey Epstein's mansion, it was my school campus. It was a post I never expected to see on my high school alumni Facebook page back in July 2019. Oh, excuse me, before I go any further, the author is Madeline Marr. It was a post I never expected to see on my high school alumni Facebook page back in July 2019. A picture of birth of Birch Wathen School with the New York Times headline, The $56 million mansion at 9 East 71 Street where Epstein allegedly abused girls. The photo was of a 1930s era Beaux Arts limestone building on Manhattan's Upper East Side. The majestic oak doors I walk through almost every day from 7th to 12th grade looked almost identical to the one in my worn out yearbooks from my memories. So that's got to be kind of chilling, right? You, You go to this school and then, you know, later on in life, the school is bought by this rich psychopath and he uses it in to turn it into a house of horrors. Epstein had just been arrested on suspicion of sexually trafficking underage girls. My Miami Herald colleague, Julie K. Brown, was all over this story for so long. She sat a few desks away while digging up the full scope of Epstein's sweetheart deal for pleading guilty in 2007 to a reduced Florida state felony prostitution charge and how the deal was engineered without the knowledge of his victims. Until the arrest, I had no idea this predator lived, at least part of the time, inside the former home of our alma mater. Alumni in my Facebook chat didn't appear to have known either. Below a post, former students flooded the comment section, appalled that their old school was now a crime scene. Pretty crazy how that works out, huh? Imagine you went to this school and then, you know, you moved away or whatever. 
And of course, you never really thought about your school again for the most part. I mean, you did the times you had with your friends in high school, blah, 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 blah. But the building itself, I mean, I never really think about the, the building from my from high school. Of course, the memories from high school are some of the best memories ever, but it still must be kind of crazy. It's really sickening to think about this happening in a place where despite a fair bit of turmoil, I have had many happy memories. I feel ill every time it crosses my news feed. I just can't believe the horrors that building has witnessed. Sad and disgusted on so many levels. Incredible, isn't it? Where we all spent our formative years. The last I had heard after I'd graduated in 1985 was that four years later, the 21,000 square foot building had been sold to the limited CEO Leslie H. Wexner for $13.2 million. Wexner apparently spent very little time there before basically handing the mansion over to his financial advisor, pedophile, Epstein for a song in 1996. And we all know that he did, he wasn't charged for that place. And we all know when he moved in, Wexner already had a camera system set up and a whole media room, the whole flip, folks. When Epstein moved into the Mogul's Digs, they certainly did not resemble a staid schoolhouse. Architectural, Architectural Digest featured the 40-room home on the cover in December of 2005. Architect Thierry Despont and interior designer John Stephanidis all but gutted the place, using Russian palaces as their inspiration, preserving the central spiral, sta- the central spiral staircase as the anchor. That staircase, where intrepid, read misbehaving, students slid down the railing, irritating the receptionist on the ground floor to no end. Had we had cell phones in that era before the selfie, those, mobile, those marble stairs would have been Instagram central. And of course, the stately entrance also remained intact. Those 15 foot high arched, arched oak doors where, the, where we hung out after class avoided teachers and swap ciggies. Images living forever on the internet show investigators prying open those same doors with a crowbar before reportedly, reportedly uncovering naked pictures of young girls. Seeing that scene, a picture taken by a neighbor on the same block felt like a kick to the gut, as if hearing an old friend had passed. I could get that. I could get that too, because I know if my high school ended up a place like this, it would make me a bit sick. Uh, you know, you think about it. You spent some of the best years of your life in high school, hopefully, and you know your formative years, like she says in the article. And you look back on stuff like that fondly, right? You want to look back on that and have a memory. And I drive by my old high school on a regular basis pretty much every single day. And every time I drive by my high school, a little smile creeps on my lips. Now, imagine you went to this school, how the feeling would probably be a lot different now that you know what occurred afterwards in this place. I know it would give me a different feeling. That is for sure. And then, the widely circulated clip of Prince Andrew cheerily waving goodbye back in 2010 to a young woman as she exits. Then, the royal shuts, shuts the now infamous doors. The images of every floor and every corner of the former Birch War, uh, Watt, Watton building we Birchies have memories of will forever be tainted by horrific, grotesque images of this disgusting man, wrote Birch alum on, on, the fa- on their Facebook page. Someone else added the ironic twist that now convicted sex offender Bill Cosby lived for so many years at number 18 across the street for a time. Unreal. And right next door to them, not that he's connected to any of this, I don't think anyway, my, my old boss Howard Lutnick from Cantor Fitzgerald. He's Jeffrey Epstein's next door neighbor. Too bad I was never invited over to old Howie Lutnick's house for any dinner, huh? I, for one choose to remember the building the way it was when it was envisioned by Herbert N. Strauss, the Macy's heir, who commissioned it in the 1930s but died before its completion. Between 1962 and 1989, it was home to Birch Wathen, founded by, in 1921 by Louise Birch and Edith Wathen. Over the years, the school's alumni included broadcaster Barbara Walters, novelist Judy Krantz, and book publisher Alfred Knopf, Jr. Student life was chronicled in the Birch Bark, our school paper, after the sale to Wexner, Birch Wathen combined with the, Le- the Lennox School to create Birch Wathen Lennox in a new location. 
I won't allow myself to wrap my head around what Epstein reportedly did with our former campus, including inserting a female doll into a chandelier, hanging a mural of a prison scene starring Epstein himself, and displaying those famously framed eyeballs of injured soldiers. No. Just no. Don't forget the picture of Bill Clinton, and don't forget the picture of Ghislaine Maxwell, ma'am. Despite its vast size, the building that housed Birch Birch Wathen, a private K-2 school of a few hundred, felt like the home it was built to be. Unfortunately for athletic types, that meant there was no gymnasium or athletic field. But having Central Park as your playground? Awesome! No theater either. We had to make do in some kind of parlor or sitting room. Our science lab was in the attic. We ate lunch in the windowless cafeteria in the basement. According to records, it used to be a laundry room, and fittingly, a wine cellar. Birchies did phys ed in Central Park, less than a block away. In colder months, we were, bi- we were bused to a nearby athletic center. As upperclassmen during lunch, we'd roam Madison Avenue, pop in for snacks at the Long Gone Cafeteria, tell secrets outside the Frick Art Museum, and loiter around Ralph Lauren's opulent boutique. Despite the notoriety that Epstein brought to the building, the fun, r- the fun running wild in New York City memories of many alumni remain re- resolutely intact. Yeah, hey, look, I get that. I'm, again, when, you're in, when you go to high school, it should be a great time. It should be a time filled with memories, building great friendships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And for these people, you know, the, knowing that, that this building was used for what it was used for after is a bit disheartening for them, right? But you know what's really disheartening and what's really gross? These people are worried about their memories of their building, and I understand that. But the girls who were molested inside of that building, their memories are going to be something completely different. Their memories are going to be something completely darker. Their memories are going to be something that haunt them forever. Would volunteer to take over the property and transform it into a transitional home shelter for victims or trafficking, offered one from our group. Beautiful idea, but Manhattan real estate has a short memory. Neither historians nor experts think Epstein's crimes will affect the palatial building's worth. Because of the several lawsuits against the Epstein estate, it could be some time before the mansion is liquidated, the Post recently reported. In July, before his death in jail, and while he was seeking release on bond, Epstein offered to put up the home, as well as his private jets as collateral to guarantee his appearance at trial. With that in mind, it is possible that the estate could sell the property and simply hold the funds as part of the total estate to be dealt with as the legal battles play out, said New York City historian Tom Miller. Either way, it appears almost certain that the mansion will continue to be used as a single-family residence. Here's hoping the new residents keep the stairway at least. Well, not one of those pieces that give us new names or anything like that. None of that. But what it does is, again, it adds context. Shows us a little bit about the building. Adds a little bit more to it. You know, and... It's, it's crazy to think that all of this was occurring in the middle of Manhattan like this, a block away from Central Park, right in the hub of the upper crust of society. But like we've discussed, the people in New York City, the upper crusters in New York City, they don't care. They'll accept Jeffrey, Ep- they would have accepted Epstein back again after his second arrest if he got out. They do not care, folks, because they do not care about regular people. We are disposable to them. Their whole entire life revolves around consolidating their power, increasing their wealth, increasing their ability to control. And that's all people like Jeffrey Epstein care about at the end of the day. And the people who have protected him, well, they're just as bad. They're just as culpable for his actions, folks. All right, if you'd like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. And if you would like to help support the show, you can click on the GoFundMe link in the description box. I will be back later on with some more Dropskis. We'll do an Evolution episode later, and we'll have the Daily Drop like usual. All right, everybody, I will talk to you later on today.